Thank you for the introduction. And um, immediately, let's start. Until about the 1800, there are two main printmaking techniques. That's relief printing and intaglio printing. Represented by this image showing both presses, wooden presses. This is a relief printing press, well, sort of. Um, it works by a platen here that is moved down to press paper against inked uh, printing form. The printing form may uh, include text and uh, woodcut images. And the other technique is intelligent printing. This is a rolling press, has two rollers. Uh, you see the upper roller. There's the bed of the press running in between both rollers. On the bed of the press is an inked copper plate, paper, and felt blankets. And by turning the cross of the press, everything is moved in between and the impression is made. Oops, there we go. Good. As I said, there are two main printmaking techniques, relief printing and intaglio printing. Most of relief printing is done by woodcut. And uh, woodcut is done in wood blocks, that's plank cut along the grain. Um, there's also metal cut in thinner, uh, brass plates, there are cast blocks which are rare, and there's wood engraving. Wood engraving is um, engraving across the grain, end grain. It's a technique developed by the late 18th century. I will talk about that later. And then there is intaglio printing, mainly engraving and etching for lines. There is metal tint for tone and aqua tint for tone etching. And uh, there are crayon techniques. Um, Intaglio printing is mostly done in copper plates, rarely in iron plates, and there are some other techniques. I will talk about supports, I will talk about printing inks, you have seen the presses. For color, there is hand coloring, already from the very beginning of uh, print history, and there's color printing. Uh, we talk about single leaf prints, we talk about block books that are books printed from woodcuts, including texts and images. Um, that's different from uh, books printed with letterpress. Then there are prints in books, that is letterpress books with extra woodcuts or um, engravings or etchings as illustrations. And there are books of prints, which are series of prints bound together to a volume. A very short chronology. Um, there are a number of antecedents uh, from prehistory onward. Um, until what we now call uh, prints, printmaking, uh, starts shortly after 1400. Relief printing begins in the 1410s. Uh, it it's, um, it concerns woodcuts printed with black ink on white paper, um, sometimes hand colored. And then uh, in the 1430s, the printing of engraved copper plates starts. We start with relief printmaking, um, stamping and making stamps, uh, inking stamps uh, is of all times. Um, on the left you see oranges with a design cut out, and you ink the oranges and you roll them over paper and you have an impression. On the right you see the famous potato print, probably started from about 1492. And in the middle uh, you see what you can do if you ink or paint your hands and press them to a surface, which process we already find uh, with cave drawings, as you can see here. That's my laser pointer here in the middle. So it's of all times. The pressing of reliefs in a, a soft surface, in this case, uh, cylinder seals rolling over clay um, is found in uh, Middle Asia. Uh, it's also found in Mid-America. Notice that here you have only the relief and the contrast is made by the relief by the, uh, and the reflection, so the shades and the reflection. There's no ink involved. The same with the so-called uh, bread stamps that were used in Egypt and in the Roman Empire. Um, and uh, also used for uh, stamping roof tiles. And in China, um, was used for bricks, clay bricks. The actual stamping with a collar um, appears in India about 400 BCE. 
I don't have an example of that, but the technique spreads to the north, to the east and to the west. And here you see an example from the Middle East, Sassanidic period. Um, you see black ink here. You see a purplish red ink printed from or stamped from a second block. And on top of that, there is gold powder. That is a sticky layer was stamped against the cloth and gold powder was dusted on top of it. In, the, uh, uh, in southern Egypt, in the town of Achim, uh, there was a textile industry in the 6th, 7th century CE. Um, textile, among many other techniques, was also stamped with small stamps and with a uh, simple pattern on either side of the stamp. But then you have a color and uh, some decoration. This is the uh, earliest complete printed or stamped, I should say, uh, book roll. It's produced in, in China in the uh, second half of the 8th century. Uh, I say complete because uh, there are fragments of earlier book rolls from the second half of the 7th century found uh, in other places of China. This book roll was found in uh, Korea in the year 1966 in the pagoda in the lower right. Um, there were burglars who blew up the pagoda to find treasures and when the monks came running they found um, all kinds of very nice stuff inside of the pagoda including this uh, book roll. An actual book, a bound book, uh, with text and images um, is this example. It is kept in the uh, British Library. The book roll of the book itself is dated and um, it converts to our date, the year 868 uh, CE. You see that the uh, uh, printing, uh, the text cutting and the image cutting, it looks quite professional. So this um, was not new, this was just one of many. It's just the only one we have left from uh, this early. In the Islamic region, uh, we also find um, stamps. There's no book printing in the Islamic region in the Ottoman Empire uh, until the 18th century. For reason that uh, uh, scripts, manuscripts were preferred and uh, but amulets were printed with a small uh, woodcuts. They were rolled up, folded up and um, carried by the uh, uh, person. On the left you see a model of a um, stamp for stamping textile. The way it was described by Cennino Cennini in his El Libro dell'Arte. That is a manuscript that um, is lost, so the earliest copy of the manuscript dates from the year 1437. In the manuscript he describes a variety of um, art technologies, including the stamping of fabric in black and in colors, and he, he describes how to make um, a stamp that is, he said, he says you take a uh, block of wood about the size of a tile, so that is roughly 15 times 15 centimeters, six times six inches, and you cut the design on one side and you have the handle on the other side. So that is like here, you have the design on one side and the handle is on the other side. And by inking and stamping this design on a piece of uh, fabric um, to the right, to the left, up and down, uh, you decorate the complete piece of fabric. On the right you see a more modern uh, stamping block uh, with a uh, much finer design and this is probably used for uh, strips of paper to be used in uh, wallpaper, as wallpaper. This block from the late 14th century, it's French, it's a, a meter high, it doesn't have a handle, uh, it's cut on both sides with uh, um, scenes from the life of uh, Christ. Uh, the inking here and printing here was probably done by inking the block, placing fabric on top of it and rubbing the verso side of the fabric. 
uh, more examples of fabric printing are found through the 14th, 15th, and 16th century up to actually uh, quite recently. Um, uh, one color in two colors, sometimes more. In the lower right, you see this little piece. It's a piece of leather. So leather also could be uh, printed, but there's hardly anything left. Actual um, prints, the way we define a print um, that is printed with a woodblock on paper, on white paper, uh, st that starts around 1410, 1420. Uh, as you can see here on the left, um, designs are quite simple. Uh, it's linear, mm, flowing lines, smooth, um, black ink on white paper, a bit of hand coloring, no shades, no hatching. This developed uh, through the uh, 15th century and in the second half of the uh, 15th century, you will find um, that lines have become more angular. You see texture, uh, you see hatching, but it's still a bit rough. Until Albrecht Dürer comes, he uh, introduced the Renaissance in printmaking in Northern Europe, at least north of the Alps. Um, and you see, um, it's a big change. Um, figures become voluminous, they have uh, shades, hatching, um, details, there's texture, a um, bit of perspective. It's a big change and um, everybody picked it up in Europe and then in the 17th century you can uh, see figures like this. But then also the importance of woodcut as a main printmaking technique uh, had declined. This is about the last really serious thing you see. Woodcut itself didn't disappear. It kept being in use uh, for uh, children's prints, for uh, decoration in books and many other things. Labels on bottles. So back to the uh, 15th, 15th century. Um, some other processes on the very left you see um, a technique called metal cut that involved a relatively thin brass plate in which uh, all the whites were cut out, like in uh, wood cutting. And if you look careful, you see in the upper margin and the lower margin uh, a black dot. That means that holes were drilled in the plate and this plate was nailed to a wood block to make it type high so it could be printed together with. Um, uh, typeface in a common press and in inking um, the tops, the, the heads of the nails were also inked. The second figure from the right concerns uh, a so-called seal print. It's an utterly rare uh, technique. Uh, I only know of one object like this. It's uh, in New York Public Library. It concerns a relief pressed in paper and next to the leaf was uh, uh, colored got a brush and, and watercolor. Um, the second from the right is a so-called paste print. Paste prints are also rare uh, because the materials they are made of are rather brittle, so the, the objects fall apart uh, quickly. Um, the technique concerns a piece of paper covered with a resin-rich paste, colored paste, and a woodcut plate or um, metal cut plate was pressed into uh, the paste to make, to create a relief and to show the uh, white of the paper underneath. Instead of white of the paper, um, a color could be used or um, gold leaf. On the very right, you see something called nature printing. Nature printing as such, we find from the uh, 14th century, perhaps even a little earlier. It's the same thing as the hands you saw pressed against uh, a cave wall. In this case, um, with nature, pr nature printing, most times, uh, leaves of plants of grasses are inked in black and um, a piece of paper is pressed against the object. In this very example here, uh, it's color nature printing, which is pretty rare. You see that the leaves are uh, inked in green and the flowers are in a purplish red. Gutenberg invented in Europe then um, book printing with uh, movable metal type. He was not the first already in uh, Korea in the um, 14th century, perhaps already in the 13th century, they printed with uh, movable metal type. The difference was that 
uh, Gutenberg invented a printing press, uh, the, the common press, book printing press you saw at the beginning, for printing uh, his texts. In parallel, um, in Germany, um, maybe even by his neighbors, uh, block books were produced, that is, text and images cut in uh, uh, a wood block, and the serial blocks forms a uh, running text, and together uh, printed they form a volume. You see an example on the left and uh, in the middle. Um, on the right, you see an example of an East European block book, in this case, a Russian. And in the uh, Eastern Europe and Russian era, area, block books were printed until the 17th century. Uh, they were also uh, printed in uh, two colors. You see red and you see black, something not happening with uh, Middle and West European block books, which are either in black ink or in a browned black ink. So uh, the example on the left is black ink and in the middle it's uh, browned ink, originally black. In letterpress, um, images were entered the, the text uh, from about 1460. That is, the text in the two examples that you see here are printed in letterpress, in black. The initials are drawn by hand with pen and ink, red ink. And the images are stamped by hand in the uh, blank area above the text and hand colored. From about 1470, you find that images and texts are uh, set in the same printing form and printed together with the same ink. Now, color. It was introduced in a relief printing uh, already by Gutenberg. That is, you see the example here of one line of rubrication printed in red. The rest of the text is in black and the other lettering and numbering uh, is drawn by hand. Um, we find rubrication on only five pages um, of the first volume of his Latin Bible from the uh, first half of the 1450s and um, in only four copies of that Bible. So it probably means that uh, it was technically very difficult for him to print um, in bed and he skipped that and in later copies, um, rubrication was drawn by hand. His followers, uh, Fust and Schiffer, uh, took over from 1457. Uh, 57, yeah. And uh, they immediately started printing uh, in multiple colors. So you see the text here in red, you see um, uh, capitals in red, in uh, blue, and here's a big initial in red and blue. Very complicated. Um, this example, this page itself, is from the 1490s, but already, as I said, from 1457. This process of color printing was used by them in letterpress. The musical printing in the 1457 missile was still drawn by hand, but here it's printed. So the red uh, staffs are printed and the uh, black notes are printed. And also from the 1470s, printers start using a so-called printers or publishers device, which could be uh, printed in red, if not in black. Erhard Radelt was um, a printer trained in Augsburg. He moved to Venice where he set up a uh, print shop. He was quite successful in his publishing and printing and very inventive in his uh, production. On the left, you see an example of uh, a text with a highly decorated initial and a decoration around the text, which was very new at the time. Uh, he went forward and um, from the uh, 14, eight, early 1480s, he printed diagrams in black from woodcuts, sometimes hand colored, but also sometimes like in this example in the middle, uh, with a color printed from uh, a separate wood block in yellow or in red and sometimes in both colors. In the second half of the 1480s, he was back in Augsburg again, and he uh, really started color printing using multiple colors in one image. Um, the figure on the right shows that the uh, first uh, wood block in black was printed. It has all the uh, details, all the decoration, all the text, 
and it was overprinted with colors in yellow, in red, in blue, and what looks brown now was um, formerly green, so the green has turned brown over time. Another way, another way of uh, color printing used by book printers is by using the frisket sheet in a book printing press. So a book printing press has a mask built in. The mask covers the area outside of the text, preventing that the white of the paper next to the text is smudged by leftover ink. Um, their way of color printing in red and black was first you print the text in black, except for the letters um, or capitals that should be in red that you take out of the printing form. Next, you clean the printing form. You put the letters and uh, capitals back. You ink the complete printing form in red, cover it with a mask with the holes cut out for everything that should be red. Printing paper on top and then you print and then you have a two-colored, bicolored impression of uh, black text with red rubrication and red uh, capitals. The example of the right goes uh, a step further. It has a large area of red text and a uh, series of woodcuts, wood blocks, uh, inked in red or in black. So in this case, two masks have been used, uh, first printing the black and then overprinting the red. Single leaf prints printed in color uh, that starts shortly after 16, uh, sorry, 1500. The example of the left is by Lukas Kranach. He colored um, a sheet of white paper in blue, printed the first block with the design, the complete design in black on the blue paper. Then uh, the second block had the highlights only with which he overprinted the black design. And the whites that you can see here in the middle and at the horizon here were scraped out. In another example, he uh, used blue colored paper printed in black and overprinted with the same block for the highlights in white. He sent these prints <coughs> to Augsburg, where Hans Burgmeier was working. And uh, Burgmeier understood how uh, Kranach had printed. And um, he tried it himself too, but he went a step further. And the example on the left shows that uh, he printed on white paper, first the design in black. And with the second block, he um, printed the tones of the design with the whites not printed, but cut out of the second block. And in the third step, you see the image on the right. He used uh, three blocks. Every block had a part of the design and only together they made a complete design. It is called interdependent printing. This technique moved to Italy within a year or two. It was picked up and uh, Ugo da Capi was um, very uh, active in using it and he applied to the Venice Senate for a privilege to print stampare chiaro et scuro, so in light and dark, from whence our uh, expression chiaro scuro printing comes from. This technique became uh, quite popular with uh, the most modern artists of the 16th century in Italy, in Germany, um, in the Netherlands, and there's one example in France. Technique was used uh, also in the uh, early 16th, 17th century, and then it died out a bit. But um, in the 18th century, we uh, see some examples of chiaroscuro printing and Jean-Michel Papillon, uh, wrote a treatise on a woodcut and in that treatise he explained and showed how a chiaroscuro woodcut was made. As you can see here in the examples, you first cut the block with the uh, background and this is uh, the uh, yellow-orange part, the red-brown, yellow-brown part and finally the shades in black and if you overprint everything you have a nice four-color design. The Englishman John Baptist Jackson uh, started in, in, in Paris and he went also in Italy and back in England. Uh, he 
not only produced large chiaroscuro woodcuts, but they also produced color printed wallpaper, of which you can hear, see an example. This is a fairly large sheet, about uh, 42 times 58 centimeters, printed in multiple colors from multiple blocks. Thomas Buick, um, working slightly later, uh, had a very different idea. Instead of cutting a plank, he uh, turned the woodblock uh, 90 degrees and started engraving in the, um, uh, across the grain of the block, which allowed him to make uh, much finer details and uh, his blocks did last also a lot longer. You can see in the example, the detail on the left, it's really tiny and how many lines that are engraved um, in just a few millimeters. Now we move to intelli printmaking. Again, uh, already in prehistory, we find examples of lines uh, incised in bone, in stone, in um, anything hard, shells. Uh, the example here of the ostrich is in rock bottom. Uh, it's scraped out probably by another stone. It's very simple, but it's effective. Metal objects with engraved lines, we find um, from already uh, 2,500 years ago, maybe even uh, older. Uh, Etruscan mirrors are famous for their decorations at the backside of the mirrors. They are produced uh, with a variety of techniques. And by close examination of the lines of decorations at the backsides, uh, in this case, you can see here, now you have to read, I have to explain you how to read this image. You see here, a V-shaped groove cut in this direction. On the right, you see my sketch. And then there was another groove, V-shaped groove cut up to here. So you see here a triangular hole, which is telling for the kind of tool used in producing, in engraving these lines. And it looks like a modern tool called a buren or graver. It's a steel rod with a diamond shaped section and it's cut askew. So the tip, so the point of the tip, I should say, is a very sharp because three sides, uh, three planes come together. And this tool looks quite like a tool seen by Vernier a hundred years ago in Cairo in the museum where it probably is present where about, I don't know. But it's about the tip and that you see here. So the tool was moved in this direction and the tip of the tool just hit the side, the other side of the V-shaped groove. So we know a bit about what tools were used. And these tools were described in a manuscript, the Scheduler Diversarum Artium, uh, probably uh, written in the first quarter of the 12th century. We don't have the original, uh, but we have a number of copies and the earliest is from about that time. Uh, this treatise has uh, described a number of um, art techniques and one of the uh, techniques described is the uh, engraving of uh, copper plates with burens and uh, the writer of the manuscript describes three different burens. The first is the same as the uh, uh, present or Egyptian buren with a diamond shaped section used for V-shaped grooves. Then there is a chisel shaped tool, so square section uh, with a flat bottom. And there is a round tool for gorging out lines. And on the right, you see some examples, uh, engraved copper plates, gilded engraved copper plates from about that period. But still, it's objects with uh, incised lines and they're not printed. The printing of engraved, engraved copper plates begins in about the 1430s. Um, in the beginning, you see playing cards and uh, devotional objects. Playing cards because um, playing cards and board games were introduced from Asia in the uh, 14th century and they became highly popular. So there was a great demand. The first were made by drawing or by painting and because of where um, they had to be replaced quickly. Uh, 
So somebody saw a market here and using uh, engraved copper plates, inking them like woodcuts, but then in intaglio. So the grooves are filled with ink and the surface is cleaned before printing. What you see here is um, two prints after the same design, but in reverse of each other, printed from two different copper plates. So the same design was first cut in one plate, and then the print of that plate was um, pressed against another copper plate to uh, reproduce the design. All through the 15th century, this develops further, and again, it's Albrecht Dürer, around uh, 1500, who brings uh, copper engraving to a new level. Uh, as you can see here, it's, it's volume, it's perspective, um, uh, lights and shade, uh, fine details, everything you want is there. And well, this was the start of uh, uh, a great new generation of printmaking. With many possibilities. The other technique developed um, shortly from shortly before 1600 is etching, so etching of metal plates. Um, I should say for, from around uh, 1500, not 1600, 1500. Again, there are antecedents, so uh, stones can be etched or actually treated with chemicals. Uh, and uh, also shells can be etched. In this case, you see uh, shells from Arizona. Um, the black part is pitch, so pitch worked as a resist against the acid. And if you would pour a vinegar or fermented fruit juice into the shell, everything around the resist will be etched to a relief. And here you see another shell on the outside has a strong relief. In China, they um, tried etching metal more particular bronze. The example on the right shows uh, an example of um, etching a blade, a bronze a blade uh, of um, a, a bronze sword. It's rather superficial. It's more patination than actual uh, relief etching, but it's, it's there. And on the left, that's actually quite deeply etched. So it's the uh, uh, base of a bronze vessel and the modern pin that is stuck into the group shows that it actually has um, particularly strong relief. Going to Europe in um, pre-Christian times, in um, the Celtic Latin culture, we see um, spearheads and we see sword blades, iron sword blades, iron spearheads, with geometric patterns which are etched here. You see the same thing here, that it's etched shows by the lines which are a bit irregular and we don't find any traces of hammering with a punch or something like that or cutting with a burin. 1500 years later in Spain, um, this sword of King Sancho IV of Castilla and Leon was produced and the uh, blade of the sword has lettering etched into it, not engraved, it's, it's etched. Now how the etching has been done, there are two possibilities. It's either with a nitric a middle acid, especially nitric acid, and here you see uh, an early recipe. Now nitric acid was invented, or the distillation of nitric acid, I should say, uh, was invented in uh, uh, the Middle East in the ninth century. And it's made its way to Europe via Islamic scholars. So it landed in uh, Spain in about the 13th century. And from the um, early 14th century, you see recipes in um, uh, European manuscripts describing how to distill uh, nitric acid. Now, don't think too much of this. Uh, these are uh, chemical manuscripts and the production will be in drops, not in liters. So it was um, uh, limited to the uh, laboratories of alchemists. A much easier and faster and cheaper way uh, to produce an etchant, so a, a liquid for etching metal, is by mixing um, uh, a copper salt with um, a chloride uh, in vinegar. So 
um, in the example in the lower left, you see copper sulfate, which is blue, and kitchen salt, uh, sodium chloride, which is white, and you pour some uh, vinegar on top of it and it turns green, which is good enough for etching an iron plate. Now it's freshly made, um, you can etch a uh, shallow relief in about 10-15 minutes, and as the recipes say, uh, you leave it in there for three or four days, uh, then it's a much stronger relief. The etching ground, I should mention, uh, in this case is a wax, just plain beeswax. The etching of blades, spearheads, daggers, dagger blades, um, uh, is found in the 14th, 15th century. Um, there are dozens of recipes for this. Um, there are hundreds of objects with, with edge decoration, edge text found. And in Germany, it developed to a true industry. Uh, here you see an example um, of decoration on armor by Daniel Hopfer, a famous uh, armor maker. But um, you see, it, it's a relief, it's lines, um, it comes close to a printing plate. And that was his idea. If you use a flat iron plate, you cover it with beeswax or something else as a resist. You draw in it, and you etch it, and then you can print it like a copper plate, and like an engraved copper plate. So that was his idea. It was a very good idea from 1495. Uh, for about 15 years, he was the only one to do it. And then he learned, uh, he taught it to his sons, and Albert Dürer tried it out, not so successful as his engraving and woodcutting. But anyway, he tried it out, and the technique was used in a German lens for until about the 1540s. 40s. Um, iron has two problems. First, um, it was rather hard metal, and a bit too hard for the uh, uh, steel of the burens of that period to be engraved with. And the other big problem is that iron does rust. Now, once it starts rusting, uh, you can, of course, scrape off the rust, but you also uh, damage the design. Lucas van Leiden, um, working in Holland, in the town of Leiden, indeed, in 1520 produced um, six plates combining etching and engraving. Now, because of the combination, we can be sure it was copper. As I said, um, the combination of etching and engraving in iron is difficult. And the other thing is we don't have any later impressions of these plates that show rust stains. Typical for uh, Lucas's etching, as you can see here, characteristics are uh, especially lines with rounded ends and hooks with J-turns and uh, some foul biting. You see here in the white background, all those little dots, that's foul biting. So uh, the resist, the etching ground, was not strong enough to give enough resist to completely resist the acid. And characteristic of engravings, uh, lines with tapering ends, uh, they're quite regular, and they don't have J-turns. The example of the detail of the face shows that on the left, it's etching. You see lines are a bit irregular. Uh, the blunt ends, you see lines with J-turns here and here. Here's a bit of foul biting in the background. And on the right, the lines are much finer tapering. Um, and this part shows where the hairs are etched and the engraving is used for shading. Once you know how to make an interior print and know how to make a woodcut, uh, you can combine it. And you see on the left uh, one of the examples from the 16th century and in the 18th century, they could also do that. And this example includes a letterpress, all printed in multiple colors. Some other uh, interior printmaking processes. Metal tint was invented by 1642 by Ludwig von Siegen, then active in Amsterdam. Um, it concerns uh, rocking the plate with a tool with a serrated edge. So a lot of sharp tips here next to each other. By moving, by rocking um, this tool over the plate in many directions, it's covered with a lot of pits and burrs. By scraping off the burrs, uh, you'll have it gray tones eventually in the impression. You see here a detail that shows a lot of the pits. A technique for making, uh, for reproducing um, 
uh, crayon drawings is uh, rolling a roulette small steel wheel set in a handle with a coarse grained thread over the copper plate and it's suited for reproducing crayon lines um, they are nicely coarse like a crayon drawing uh, which you can see here and if you look very closely at details you see some of the dots are triangular these are made with a burin this is exactly the same thing as you have seen in uh, the lines of the Etruscan uh, mirror so you push the tip of a burin into the copper plate and you get a small triangular bit in etching a technique called aqua tint was developed aqua tint concerns dusting your plate with fine rosin powder you heat the plate a little the rosin powder melts and um, you create a lot of drops globules on top of the plate with metal around it still free if you immerse such a plate in acid then the metal will be bitten and the uh, whites are the uh, drops of rosin that is left it's unbitten and um, van der Velde already was capable of etching uh, three or four different tones and like in uh, metal tint as you can see here in the background he's uh, scraped and polished out some of the uh, lighter areas unfortunately he didn't explain his technique to others so it died out and only a century later Jean-Baptiste Le Prince reinvented the same technique now there are over the centuries about a dozen different aqua tint techniques uh, developed in uh, different ways but they all uh, concern etching and creating tonalities. Cornelis Ploos van Amstel uh, was a dealer in wood. Uh, he was a rich man, art collector, but he also had uh, artistic skills. And from about 1750, he started uh, trying to develop a crayon etching technique. And you see the examples on the left, uh, very simple uh, crayon like lines. These are made by um, pasting a sheet of paper with some glue, dusting some hard particles like sand or like copper filings on top of the glue, letting it dry, you turn it over, place it on an etching ground and you rub the paper from the other side and um, in print you get things like this. Now after some 10-15 years it developed further and he was able to create not only crayon lines but also tonalities like in aqua tint with it. Color printing. Um, I should say that color printing in both relief printing and interior printing is relatively rare. It depends very much on the period, um, on the uh, region where you are and on the subject matter. So some subject matters like um, uh, devotional images are rarely printed in colors and others like medical uh, imagery are uh, very relatively often printed in colors. On the left you see the very first intelligent printed um, color plate. It was an engraving um, that was designed to be printed uh, in reverse. So you see that the white of the eyes and the highlights of the fabric and of the hair uh, are printed white. If you would print this with black ink on white paper it would look like a negative. This is very uncommon. The majority of color interior prints are in blue or in red or in brown and they do exactly the same thing as an impression in black would do. Some other color options are uh, on the left uh, not printing but casting. Uh, in this case a copper plate was inked in red, a wall was built around it, gelatin was poured onto uh, the plate and when the gelatin was dry it could be peeled off to make an impression, to show the impression. You could print on colored paper, you could print on colored silk or other fine fabric. Um, these are the two very first Italian printed book illustrations. It, they concern a paper instrument. On the left you have a lunar uh, quadrant and on the right you have a so-called volvel. In both cases you see red 
and the black lines in the quadrant are drawn by hand. And on the right, you see that the base plate of the Volvel was printed in red with the lines over the red are drawn by hand and the lettering and so on. But the two dials are printed from engravings um, inked in black. So this is a so-called composite print. So three impressions tied together with a, a knot. You see here the knot of the axis. Um, composite prints are not rare, you find them over the centuries, but the color printing of composite prints is a rarity and I only know it later on from the 19th century. Another way of coloring, of uh, interlocal color printing, is by inking one plate in two colors, so uh, the virgin and child are inked in red and the background around it is inked in blue and the whole was uh, printed in one run through the press. Uh, still another way is you make one big plate, you cut it in several parts and you into different parts in different colors. Um, the inking of one plate in two colors uh, is found in the 16th and 17th century. By the late 17th century, we find that Johannes Tyler, a military engineer, a Dutch military engineer and um, uh, inventor, came with the idea of inking one copper plate in really multiple colors. And uh, this uh, cockerel is inked in 10 different colors. And it's huge, big plate. Um, after 1700, Jacob Christophe Leblanc, uh, an artist from Frankfurt in Main and active in Amsterdam, invented a completely new technique. And his idea was what if I overprint um, different plates to make one image, so that's interdependent uh, printing, uh, but not with the colors next to each other, but over each other, so superimposing. And this is what is shown here. So here's the blue plate. The yellow plate is printed on top of the blue to create greens. Yellow and blue makes green. And on top of that, the red plate was printed to create a complete spectrum. As you can see here in the final state, you see here in the detail, all the colors from red over orange, yellow, green, blue to purple. Crayon engraving again, um, developed further in France. Um, it was often used for the reproduction of crayon drawings in red or in black or two colors, red and black. And you could also print in black and white on blue paper. Louis-Marin Bonnet developed it further uh, for the reproduction of pastel drawings. An example on the right shows 11 colors printed from eight plates. Still further uh, went Francois Janinet, who developed um, uh, roulettes, so these small steel wheels uh, with um, very finely grained uh, threads. And uh, he developed techniques for reproducing watercolors, as you can see with the example in the middle. Now look carefully, you see a tiny little dot, a pinhole here and a pinhole there. The pinholes were in the plates, the copper plates used in uh, printing the image. And needles were stuck through the holes to fix the paper in the right position on top of the plate, on the various plates. And here you see detail from another print. But you can see blue here in the uh, edge and around and inside of the pinhole you see yellow and red and black which are the four colors as used by uh, Jacob Christoph Leblanc to produce the image. By the very end of the 18th century you see uh, the, event, uh, the invention of lithography by Alois Seinefelder. It's a very new technique. It's not a relief, no interlay, no relief. Uh, everything is in the same uh, plane. So it's a planographic technique. And um, Godefra Engelmann got the idea of combining it with Leblanc's trichomatic process, and then he invented chromolithography, and from there uh, it developed to our present CMYK printing used in um, digital printing, in uh, offset printing, uh, photocopying, so quite modern. My thanks to uh, the following people, and finally I thank you for your attention. <laughs>